Um, Um... Aqueles classificados superiores têm prestígio e privilégio na gozado por aqueles que são mais baixos. Além disso, os superiores normalmente têm algum controle sobre as ações daqueles que são inferiores. No entanto, o superior também tem deveres de proteção e cuidado pastoral uh, para aqueles subordinados a eles. Metade da relação espacial, uh, relação temporal e magnitude, são normalmente utilizadas para distinguir pessoas de posição diferentes. Uh, por exemplo, um rei 
que tem uma sala de audiência maior do que um príncipe, ou um rei que chega depois de um príncipe. Uh, outros exemplos incluem classificações militares, a autoridade dos pais, pais sobre os filhos dele, especialmente em sociedades mais tradicionais, uh, sistemas de castas e autoridade de Deus sobre a humanidade. Uh, manipulação coerciva crua, uh, manipulação coercia, uh, crua não é considerada classificação pela, pela autoridade. Uh, é mais devidamente categorizada como a relação nula, the null relation, ou seja, uh, na qual as pessoas se tratam de formas não sociais. Equality matching, ou seja, correspondência por igualdade, uh, se tenta atingir e manter um equilíbrio e até mesmo uma correspondência personalizada entre indivíduos ou grupos. Quando não há um equilíbrio perfeito, as pessoas tentam manter o controle do grau de desequilíbrio, a fim de calcular a quantidade de coração necessária. Uh, se você e eu, por exemplo, se você e eu estamos fora de, uh, de equilíbrio, nós sabemos aqui iria reestabelecer a igualdade. Exemplos incluem no princípio de uma pessoa, um voto, pontos de partida iguais em uma corrida, revezamento de convites para jantar e proporcionar igual número de minutos para cada candidato para fazer um discurso no ar. E, finalmente, market pricing. A precificação pelo mercado é a aplicação de índices para a interação social. Pode envolver a maximização ou minimização, como na tentativa de maximizar o lucro ou minimizar a perda. Mas também pode envolver a chegar a uma proporção intuitivamente justa, como num juiz decidir sobre uma punição proporcional ao crime. Para o mercado, todas as relevantes de um relacionamento são reduzidas a uma única medida de valor, como dinheiro ou prazer. Uh, a maioria uh, de princípios de utilitarismo envolvem maximização, isso é uma forma de... Uh, classificação pelo mercado. Uh, uma exceção seria o utilitarismo negativo, cujo princípio é a minimização, minimização do sofrimento. Uh, mas, todos os princípios uh, utilitaristas são aplicações da precificação pelo mercado. Desde o máximo e o mínimo são ambos proporções. Outros exemplos incluem Alugoéis, impostos, análises de custo-benefício, dízimo e prostituição. Tem sido extensivamente corroborada por estudos controlados com base em pesquisas que utilizam uma grande variedade de métodos que investigam fenômenos diversos, incluindo estudos interculturais. A investigação mostra que os modelos elementares desempenham um papel importante na cognição e isso inclui a percepção de outras pessoas. Um, enquanto todos os modelos relacionais são analisáveis em quatro modelos fundamentais, o número de modelos como tal é indefinido, de fato é indefinido, isso ocorre porque a cognição social relacional é produtiva, ou seja, gerativa. Né? Qualquer exemplo de um modelo pode servir como componente de um exemplo ainda mais complexa de um modelo. Uh, considere classificação pela autoridade e uh, precificação pelo mercado. 
Un ejemplo de un, po, de un puede ser incorporado en o subordinado a una instancia de otro. Uh, cuando un juez decide sobre una punición que sea proporcional al crimen, el juez está usando una escala de razón y, por tanto, usa también precificación pre, pelo mercado. Mas, o juiz só isso por causa uh, da sua autoridade, do avante classificação pela autoridade. Um, temos aqui um caso de pre precificação pelo mercado incorporado numa característica superordenada. Uh, superordenada estrutura da classificação pela autoridade, resultando no modelo composto. Um, uh, para continuar um pouco, uh, cada modelo elementar entra crucialmente em certos valores morais. Uma ética de serviço para um grupo é uma forma de correspondência por igualdade. Classificação pela autoridade informa uma ética de uh, obediência à autoridade, incluindo o respeito, honra e lealdade. Equidade e uma distribuição de um uniforme são informadas pela correspondência por igualdade. Precificação pelo mercado informa valores libera libertários de entrar livremente em contratos e assumir riscos como o objetivo de aumentar a própria utilidade ou a, ou a utilidade de um grupo. Okay. So, foi um resumo da teoria. Um, all right. Okay, so at this point, I want to turn the discussion over to our first speaker, Alan Page Fisk. And... Um, Well, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, John, and, and thank you, uh, thank all of you uh, at Unisnos who helped make this possible. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased and uh, proud to be here, and, and uh, I must say it sounds really wonderful in Portuguese, and uh, <clears throat> I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that uh, I can use that uh, precy uh, before all the talks that I give, because it, uh, <clears throat> it sounds much better in Portuguese than it does in English. But uh, thank you, thank you all. Um, I want to present to you uh, this theory, um, and there is a great deal of supporting evidence of, ver of many, many kinds, and I'll try to talk a little bit at the end about that supporting evidence, but um, there are now maybe 300 articles, books, theses, and dissertations, and chapters uh, by two or three hundred other people about this. And so I, rather than uh, <coughs> sort of present the supporting evidence, what I really want to do is focus on the theory today. And then if people would like to ask about the evidence or I can, you know, I, I can give you a URL where <coughs> many, many empirical papers uh, uh, of all different kinds, a huge variety of kinds are, are posted. Um, <coughs> so let's get going and let me talk about, uh, let me talk about the, uh, the theory itself. And uh, so, oops, okay, so, well, hang on a second here. Let's get it up there. Oh, okay, all right, yeah, okay. So what is the theory intended to do? What, what is the goal of the, oh, sorry. <laughs> What is the theory intended to do? Well, the, the, the purpose of the theory, the intention of the theory, is to uh, explain how people coordinate, okay? How do people coordinate so that what each person does makes sense with reference to what the other person does, and so each person's behavior completes and complements in some way what the other one does. Um, and not only do people coordinate, but people generally very often cooperate. Uh, they cooperate in the sense that they coordinate in a way which, where uh, they, <coughs> each of them benefits uh, to the extent that the other one cooperates, okay? Uh, 
but if the, each person could, in the short run, defect, could defect, and in the short run, get uh, be better off as an individual. And yet, you see over and over again, uh, it's not only that people coordinate, but that they cooperate uh, and doing things that are in the interest of other people. So that's what we want to explain. Um, but we also want to explain, and John raised this issue, why there is so much cultural variation, and what is the nature of the cultural variation. Because if you are an anthropologist, uh, what you, the first thing you see is that people in different cultures organize their social relations in, in innumerable different ways. And how can we understand that, uh, all those innumerable variations, as, uh, is, is the variation simply um, random, or is there some kind of systematicity um, to the, uh, you know, can we explain the way that the variation among cultures is organized? Okay, so those are uh, some of the problems that we want to solve. Um, and additional problems are um, to understand what aspects of sociality are innate and which are learned, which of course relates very closely to the problem of cultural variation, but what what we are very uh, ex exceptionally social creature, how much of that is part of our, how much of that is part of uh, our genetic and epigenetic uh, constitution and how much of it is acquired during development. Um, how are the aspects learned, okay? Because one of the problems is if, if, if people are capable of learning cultural variations on uh, forms of sociality, we have to have a theory of what it is that they know in order to learn what they learn. Because you can't learn anything unless you have some structure that enables you to learn that. How specific is the structure to sociality and what is the nature of that structure that enables the cultural learning? Um, and how do the innate and the, and the cultural parts of, of sociality, how do they connect to each other? How do they form a, a whole? Um, so one way to think about that is that, it, uh, uh, you know, babies are born Babies are born um, there we go. Yeah. Babies are born capable of participating in, in any culture. They're, they're omnipotent. They have the, the potential to participate in any culture, but they become participants in a specific uh, culture. And, and they become not only uh, capable but committed to that particular culture. And the question is, how do they do that? So how do children? go from this capacity to participate in any culture to people who were highly motivated and committed by partic to particular cultures. Now human sociality, the overall context for this is that human sociality is unique. Um, we are uniquely dependent more than any other species except uh, perhaps naked mole rats and, and of course uh, in, among the invertebrates, uh, the social insects. But we are in, in uniquely among mammals dependent on our sociality. You don't anywhere in the world see individuals able to function and live their lives entirely alone and then mate and then go their own ways again. That many, that's very typical of mammal social or, mammals. Most mammals are not socially organized. Most mammals are not dependent on for their survival and reproduction on uh, social cooperation. A, a few are, but 95% of or so of species are not. Uh, we are exceptionally dependent. Um, but not only dependent, we're, we are uh, uniquely capable of sociality and uniquely motivated. We, are, we, we have very powerful needs and drives to be social. Um, and our sociality is extremely complex, much more complex than that of naked mole rats or dolphins or wolves or, uh, <coughs> or uh, you know, any other, or, or, or the social insects. We have in incredibly complex social organization and uh, yet incredibly variable across cultures. Um, and we are constantly generating new forms of sociality, new forms of new ways of cooperation. So when the internet emerges, we, orga we, have, we have to de devise new ways of organizing that. And uh, when, when various other for digital forms have, arised, have arisen, we have to figure out how to coordinate those things. And we can generate new forms of coordination for any technical and environmental possibility. So our forms of sociality are generative and seems to seem to be generative without length. So the question is, how do we do it? What are the building blocks that we use to relate? And how many models do we have? How many structures do we have that we use to coordinate with each other? How many ways do we have to generate our own social action, to motivate our own social action, to understand others' social action, 
to remember and think about social action, um, and to evaluate, to make moral judgments and have emotional responses to our own, our partners, and third parties' uh, actions, which we use to sanction and redress uh, uh, violations of, of these social relational models. And, and all that can be put in the basket of social coordination. How many different ways of, of that do we do? Well, look around the universe if you haven't lately, okay? The universe is complex, enormously complex, enormously diverse. What are the, f what are the forces that give structure to the entire universe? What determines the morphology and the dynamics of the entire universe? How many basic forces are there? Gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. There are only four forces that give structure to the and, 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 and organize the dynamics of the entire universe. And yet the universe is a very complex place, very diverse, all kinds of things in it. Okay? Biological organisms are complex. They have complex physiology, complex anatomy, complex behavior. But what is the code that determines the anatomy and physiology and much of the behavior and, 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 and of course, the developmental processes for all animals? Well, okay, there are just four nucleotides in the genetic code that, can, that are sufficient to, to generate all of the complexity that we see and innumerable new organi organisms that can arise and innumerable forms of, uh, of, of anatomy and physiology and so forth. So what does that tell you? But it doesn't, I don't think, tell you. I don't think there's anything magical about the number four, okay? But what it tells you is that enormous complexity and diversity can be constructed with a very, very small number of elementary structure and principles. So, human sociality is complex and diverse. How many relational models are there that organize it all? Well, four. Now, I really don't think this is not a numerological exercise. I don't really think there's anything special about four. Um, but I want to say that there are just four elementary relational models. And that a relational model is elementary if it's used to coordinate all forms of sociality, all kinds of things from organizing work to making decisions to exchanging objects to the use of resources and so forth and so on. Okay, all domains of sociality. If it's universal across cultures and throughout history, that doesn't mean that it's equally used in all cultures or at all points in history. It's used everywhere. Okay? And if it's irreducible to simpler forms, and if it's either innate or <coughs> in some interesting way emergent naturally in social coordination, those are not simple alternatives. <coughs> Any process that was systems together naturally emergent would be would evolve to by Baldwinian selection to become innate, okay, because it would be enormously advantageous to know them ahead of time if they were going to be emergent anyway. Okay? <coughs> so it's elementary if it has those properties, and if it's intrinsically motivated, if it's an end in itself. If people find people seek to engage in these forms of social relationships merely for their own sake, or not merely for their own sake, but in part for their own sake. Okay? So that's what an elementary relational model would be. Um, and what are they? Okay? So what are these four elementary relational models? Well, um, one of them that's, very, that's ubiquitous, that we see everywhere, is when people feel connected. They feel that they have something essential in common. Um, and um, we'll call that communal sharing. Okay? Communal sharing is a relationship in which people feel that they have some essence or something essential in common. Very often they feel if they, 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 it's a little ineffable, but they will talk about it as if they, there was some essence in their bodies, really, that they shared with other people. Um, it makes them all the same in some respect. It doesn't mean that they don't know that they're different in other respects, but they feel the same in some respect. Um, um, and typical examples are everything from people who are deeply in love, and weaker forms of it can exist in families, or you know, you can be uh, a person at Unisnos, okay, or you can be Brazilian. Um, that's a form of communal sharing in the sense that you have something uh, in common that makes you that makes you all makes you the same in some way. So it can be very intense, or it can be 
milder, but the point is that you organize some aspect of social relationships, you coordinate some aspect of sociality in terms of what you have in common with another, one other person or a whole group of people, or it can be people that you've never met, but some category of persons, okay? Um, mathematically, it's an equivalence relation. So if, you're, if you have a background in mathematics, you recognize that this is an equivalence relation in which there are sets, uh, uh, in this case of persons, who are equivalent for some purpose. It doesn't mean they're identical, but it means they're equivalent for the purpose of the social coordination. And if you've taken any statistics, you know that there's a, a uh, as, as Smitty Stevens defined them, there are four basic scales of measurement, and one is what's called a categorical or nominal scale when uh, there are simply uh, categories in your scale and uh, elements are assigned to to sets according to, and they're, they're uh, you know there could be one or there could be any any number of sets but within uh, when the objects that are assigned to one set are treated as equivalent for the purpose of measurement okay so there are certain types if you like okay so the social relations that are meaningful <coughs> and the operations that are meaningful socially are the same as those that are meaningful in an equivalence relation or a nominal scale of measurement. Okay? Um, so what are, what are the everyday forms of that? Well, the sense of one for all and all for one. Um, people can share in production so that they, <coughs> they, they, they feel that they, you know, they, they farm a field together or they pool their... Um, they pool their labor working together to, to accomplish something together, right? Or that they could share in consumption, okay? So people could work separately, but put their money in the same bank account or, their, or their, the food that they produce in the same granaries or share the food they bring back to camp as hunter-gatherers do with meat for, typically. Uh, the meat is shared around with everybody in the, in the, uh, in the camp. Um, the communal sharing can take the form of communal property. So we have a park or we have a road that is communally shared, or among the Mossi where I worked in West Africa, all land is, is, is a commons. It belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to any, any individual. You can't buy it or sell it or anything like that. You can't alienate it. Um, it just belongs to everyone. Okay, now you can use it. You can farm on it. But if you stop farming, somebody else could use it. Um, it's a commons, okay? Mutual defense is another form of communal sharing, where you band together to, uh, <coughs> to defend something. Um, the sense of collective responsibility, where if I do something wrong, my family, my clan, all takes responsibility for <coughs> either paying a fine or, or restitution of some kind, or all being vulnerable to retaliation for, this, for something that one person has done. Um, group identity, the sense of identity and solidarity is an equivalence relation. The ideal, if not always the practice of communism, where uh, from each according to his or her need and to each according to their, I mean, sorry, from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. That's a, you know, that is the, the political ideology, if you like, of communal sharing. Or the more, the more recent notion of one shared world, that we all live in the same world and we all will thrive or, <coughs> or suffer together. Okay, so those are examples in different domains of sociality of communal sharing. Now, each relational model has a, a conformation system that's distinctive. Now, what is a conformation system? Well, it's a cognitive, semiotic, and constitutive uh, medium, okay, in which people cognize, okay, in which people represent or mentally think about uh, a relationship, in which they communicate. It's a medium of communication. It's a way of constituting the relational model, making it exist, and modulating it. It's a way of coordinating, actually, day-to-day -day operation of the relational model, and it's the way children discover how to implement that relational model in the local cultural forms. But the confirmation system is also uniquely evocative. It's a medium not only for representing, but a, a performative medium for actually creating the relationship. And when you do things within the, you can create relationships in many ways, but when you use the confirmation system of a relational model, you make people very strongly committed to it. It's a very evocative and emotive form. So what is the conformation system of communal sharing? Okay, it's what we call consubstantial assimilation. It's that you make the bodies of the persons alike or you represent them as having something in common. Uh, you can do that through intimate sex, 
giving birth to a person, of course, makes you feel, identify with them intensely. Nursing, giving the fluid of your own body to raise a child. Um, uh, through feeding and commensalism, so, you know, actually putting food in somebody's mouth or preparing food or sharing food, not where you eat off separate plates and so forth, but where you drink from a common calabash or you reach into to the same pot and eat out of that. Um, uh, touch, so hugging, touching, caressing, okay, is a form of connecting people through their bodies uh, by modifying their body surfaces uh, in various ways or coloring the body surfaces. Um, and so, for example, we were talking, we saw earlier the, those uh, initiates from Gabon and the Maasai warriors who made their, you know, everybody in the category made their skin the same color uh, or by genital modification, uh, you know, circumcising <coughs> or infibulating or whatever in a particular way. is a very powerful marker of group membership. Um, and also through rhythmic synchronous movement. So people who dance together in a ritual context or even in a non-ritual context, people who do military drill together, march in synchrony and so forth, come to feel a very, very powerful sense of, of, of being one body, one substance. So that's the confirmation system of communal sharing. And for those of you who are semioticians, uh, you know that it's indexical, okay, in which the body indexes the social relationship. Relations between bodies are be, you know, are both not only represent, but actually are constitutive of rela so the social relations of the persons involved. Okay? So that's consubstantial assimilation. Um, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to connect <coughs> to the a different, the other screen here, and then it'll be a little less distracting. There. Is that better? Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, what we can, I'm not a neuroscientist, <coughs> but the evidence, uh, uh, since I first formulated this theory, at, when I first formulated the theory in 1991, I had no idea what the biochemistry of this was. <coughs> but actually, pretty quickly after that, <coughs> it began to emerge that there was a particular set of peptides that uh, probably mediates the system among, among other chemicals. Um, so oxytocin and, and arginine vasopressin, which are very closely related peptides, very, very similar to each other. Um, and we, we know that oxytation, oxytocin is, uh, is uh, released through in stimulation of the cervix. So when you have a baby or when you have sex, right, the stimulation of the cervix is, is, is evoking release of, of, uh, uh, <coughs> of oxytocin. Nursing also evokes it. It's in breast milk as well. Um, vasopressin seems to be more important in male bonding, but it's, it's not quite that simple. Oxytocin and vasopressin are involved in both, and males are very responsive to, to oxytocin as well as to vasopressin. Huh. Um, and we know that the, the genetically controlled, there's a single gene that actually controls where the receptors to um, where the receptors for vasopressin are in the male gene, and by actually transferring that gene from one animal to another, you can turn <coughs> what is otherwise a promiscuous animal into a pair bonding animal. Okay, so this has been done with bowls. Um, so the receptors to uh, <coughs> for vasopressin are, are uh, crucially important in in. Uh, in, in the communal sharing relationship and, and uh, the formation of that, okay? Um, and we know that if you spray oxytocin up your nose, people get more trusting, more cooperative, and, and so forth, okay? And if, if you've ever taken ecstasy, okay, MDMA, uh, or if you've read about it or you know anybody who has, um, you know that people who take MDMA, MDMA releases a lot of oxytocin, and it makes people feel intensely bonded and connected and just wanting to love everybody, okay? Um, so we think that oxytocin and arginine vasopressin are the primary mediators of uh, communal sharing, but there are pro but other, other chemicals are also involved. It isn't just the one or, one or none. It's, it's, you know, prolactin, which is involved in milk letdown, it seems to be involved in serotonin and, and uh, you know, dopamine and cortisol and so forth. It's not, it's not, it's not quite as simple as just saying CS equals 
<coughs> equals uh, oxytocin and vasopressin. Um, we also know that there are certain nerves that mediate this. So if, uh, if, you, if you brush, okay, if you, if you brush somebody's hand or any other part of the hairy skin, not the, not the palms or the soles, but any other part, you, you uh, stimulate a particular kind of neuron, uh, uh, which uh, seems to have evolved to respond to maternal licking, which is what mammals do with their babies, um, and also what your cat or your dog or many other mammals, or even a cow or a horse does to express affection and indicate affection, and what is released um, in primates, primates don't lick each other, but what do they do? If they want to be friends with each other, <laughs> they groom each other and eat the, eat the parasites on each other's skin, okay? And that, this feeling, this, you know, going through the, the skin, okay, of the other, uh, presumably is stimulating exactly these, these neurons. Um, well, what part of the brain is involved? These days you can't hardly talk about anything without talking about what part of the brain is involved. Well, we don't know for sure, but there is a part of the brain um, called the insular cortex, which uh, is, the, is the, uh, the, part of the, the part of the cortex that receives input from many uh, lower brain systems, but basically monitors the state of the surfaces of the body. Okay, it keeps track of how the body is doing, whether it's maintaining homeostasis, whether you're being whether you're being touched by somebody or whether you're ingesting something, and notice that food, remember, is, is crucial to, to communal sharing. And um, so the insulin represents to the cortex the state of the body and so forth. Um, but we think it represents not only whether the, the state of the body, but whether the body, but, but the, the sense of what is included in the body, because we think of other people as having the same essence or body when we're in a communal sharing relationship with them. Okay, and um, so it, we're not sure about this, but it looks like the insular cortex. Okay, there are insular cortices on both sides are, are involved in representing. Uh, the communal sharing relationship, and not just the insular cortices, actually, it's what's called the agranular, which is the anterior and posterior part of the insular cortex, okay, the front, the lower front part, which is, which is uh, un, un, under a microscope anatomically distinct, okay, so it's called the agranular part of the, of the uh, cortex. It's not, unfortunately, green, uh, but, you know, that's just to show you what it looks like, where it is, that's, if you, it's the deepest part of the cortex, you have to cut away the temporal lobe to, to find it in, you're doing anatomy, um, but next time you see an insular cortex, uh, you'll know that that might be very important in love and bonding of all, of all kinds. Okay, now where did this come from, this evolutionarily? Phylo, you know, what's the phylogeny of this? Well, we, the mammals and birds, we know, are distinguished by the fact that mothers take care of their babies, okay? There's maternal bonding, okay? And this uh, does seem to be controlled by oxytocin. Um, in a few species of mammals, not in most, but in a small minority of species of mammals, they're pair bonding. And that seems to be a generalization uh, in which the, the mechanism for mothers bonding to their offspring uh, is exapted, okay, or reused to form bonds between the, the, the two parents who then cooperate in uh, child rearing and defense of the nest or defense of the den or whatever. Um, and so from that, you get paternal bonding, okay? Because once you have pair bonding, uh, it, it's, it, it can be adaptive in certain species for the fathers to be bonding. And then there are other species in which there are helpers at the nest. So the older siblings or even the aunts and uncles can be involved in, in caretaking and they can jointly defend uh, the group. Um, and then uh, in, in many species of primates, uh, and nearly all, but not quite all, uh, they, they, the, social, the, the social group, uh, a troop, or it's called different things in different species, but a group, there's a large group of animals that <coughs> they don't usually defend a territory exactly, but they defend each other against outsiders, and they're very tolerant of, of insiders in the group, and very hostile and aggressive, and join together to <coughs> to uh, push off or even to attack uh, members of outside groups. So that's probably the phylogenetic uh, processes. Uh, behind the very flexible kind of group bonding that we get in human beings where you can belong to innumerable cross-cutting groups 
different ones being activated at different times. So there, there is a phylogenetic history, presumably, although, of course, it's, there are no fossils of human behavior, so it's very hard to know exactly what was going on 500,000, a million, a million 500,000 years ago. Okay? So communal sharing is the first relational model. What's the second? Um, the second relational model is ubiquitous, um, exists in culture after culture. Okay, and uh, you can usually see who the boss is because we've got something, or the, who the high status is because they have something that makes them look bigger, that, you know, that some kind of headdress that makes them stand out from other people, <clears throat> or they're raised up on a dais, okay, with something on their head and maybe robes that make them look bigger, and the other people uh, in front of them are bowing down, lowering themselves, okay. Um, so there's people above and below, the big people and the little people. Um, those are relations of authority ranking, where people are asymmetrically differentiated as superiors and subordinates, and where the people above are, are perceived as legitimately in that position by virtue of their age or their <coughs> achievement or their, you know, something that they've accomplished or their ancestry. Um, and the, the, it's not just that the subordinates are expected to uh, show respect and deference and to follow the leaders, but the leaders are expected to stand up for, speak up for, look out for, uh, <clears throat> and shield and protect and guide and give wisdom to their subordinates. Okay. Um, now, I'm not when I talk about authority ranking, I want you to understand I'm not talking about control or force, pure coercion, right? Nor am I talking about power in the in, in the social science sense of being able to get what you want whenever you want it. Okay. Authority ranking can be correlated with that, but it can also be true that the people in authority are constantly having to give and work and so forth and are not necessarily getting more than other people. But whether they are or not, it's not based on force or coercion or purely the ability to get what you want. Nor is it necessarily exploitive. Any social relationship can be exploitive of one party or the other, but <clears throat> authority ranking is not defined in terms of exploitation and it doesn't always involve exploitation. It can involve exploitation, uh, but it doesn't necessarily. So military or bureaucratic hierarchies, systems of seniority, filial piety, and also you can have any of these, uh, you can have relations of any of these kinds. A person can perceive himself to be in a relationship of any of these kinds with immaterial beings. And of course, in many, um, most religious systems, there are superior beings, okay, below which humans are ranked. Okay, there are ranks among humans, uh, but then there are beings above those. And not quite all religions, but nearly all. Uh, um, and you can have an authority ranking relationship as a subordinate to a superior being who should look out for you and protect you as long as you please him or her and uh, give them the proper gifts and fealty and so forth. Okay? Um, mathematically, it's a linear ordering. Okay? It has the exact structure and operations of a linear ordering. Uh, the same things are socially meaningful in authority ranking as a, as a mathematically meaningful in a linear ordering. And if you remember your statistics course, it's the same thing as, a, as an ordinal scale. In an ordinal scale, the order is defined, but not the distances between them. There's no, there's no zero point. It's merely an, or, an ordering without, uh, without any specification of, 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 of distance or zero point or proportionality or anything like that. Okay? But, the, the diff, but, but unlike an ordinal, unlike a, a, a nominal scale in which there are simply categories and there's no, you can't say that what their relations are, in this case, there are different types or categories, but you can rank them. You can put them in a linear order. Okay? So that's true of authority ranking. Um, so systems of precedence and privilege, chains of command, bureaucratic and religious offices, ranking of sports teams and universities, feudal hierarchies, uh, you know, the idea of the great chain of being. Uh, in many societies, genders are ranked. People are ranked by age. Uh, people within a university can be ranked, and so forth. Well, these are ubiquitous. The authority ranking is much more important in some cultures than others. Uh, so, for example, hunter-gatherer societies uh, of, the, of the technologically simpler kind that, that are unable to store and transport and trade uh, resources tend to have very little authority ranking. There is a certain amount of prestige of being a good hunter or a good cook or a good gatherer or something, but uh, those can't be asserted really. Um, so they're more a matter of people 
admiring you, but you still don't have any status over people in the sense that <coughs> there's any stable authority in that sense. Okay, so each of these uh, forms of, each of these relational models are, are prevalent in different kinds of cultures to different degrees, but they all seem to be present in all of them. So, what's the conformation system for authority ranking? Okay, how do people think about it? How do they communicate it? How do they create it? How do children learn? Uh, what hierarchies are operative? They use, they treat, people treat social rank as if it's a, a magnitude uh, or a dimension. Okay, so we can call it a physics. Okay, there's an iconic physics. In, semiotically, it's iconic in which uh, there are dimensions along which people are placed. So we put people, we think of, and we talk about, and we actually place people higher and lower, okay? And uh, many of the ter terms for authority ranking are terms for position in a vertical space, right? So we talk about superiors and inferiors, higher up and lower down. We can talk about big people and little people, okay? The great people and the minor people in, in history and so forth. Um, we also put, we talk about people who are ahead and behind, okay? The leaders and their followers, the leaders and their backers. And as soon as I turn my back on you, I'm indicating social superiority, which is why you don't turn your back on the king, okay? Because then you're in front and he's behind, right? Okay, so front and back. Um, more numerous, so we, we address people in a number of languages, in a number of language families. We address people as if they were in the plural, and uh, so there's the royal we and the, and the, and the, the the plural vous in French, for example, and in, in other Romance languages. Um, uh, there's also temporal precedence, who goes first, who gets to speak first, who is greeted first, who gets uh, the first chair of things, uh, who goes through the door first, and who's first in the procession. We treat uh, authority uh, also as a, as a magnitude of force. So we talk about the a forceful leader. Um, so we elected, sadly, in California, Arnold Schwarzenegger at one point, because we wanted a strong leader, okay? Now, most strong leaders are not necessarily able to bench press huge weights, but we think of them as strong and forceful, even though in Newton's, uh, they may or may not be, okay? But that's the way we think about authority ranking. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, brightness is used. I don't have time to go into the archaeology of that, but, but uh, if you read about the Buddha, or you look at uh, the, the, the nobility uh, in, in, in Aztec and Incan and Mayan societies, they made themselves very shiny. They wore shiny uh, layers of metal and decorated the temples and palaces with, with gold alloy sheets and so forth uh, and made themselves very, very bright, okay? And the other thing is that when, when the king emerges or whatever, what do you hear? You hear drum rolls and trumpets and bugles uh, gongs and loud, you know, big bells ringing, okay? So authorities are marked by being louder, okay? In a great many very different cultures. So basically, uh, social ranking is treated as if it's a quantity or a position along a dimension, okay? As if it's a magnitude or a dimension. And in that sense, uh, the ranking of people socially is mapped iconically onto spatial or magnitude uh, you know, physical magnitude or physical space. So in that sense, it's iconic. And it's not only representative, but it's also constitutive. So being placed above and having somebody else go down below you is constitutive. It creates the authority ranking relationship. What is the substrate for that neurologically? Um, well, the analog magnitude system, which represents all kinds of magnitudes, all the kinds of magnitudes that I talked about, physical size and number, approximate number, and uh, the, the intensity of stimulus and so forth, uh, is in the intraparietal sulcus, okay? Uh, particularly the lateral segment of it. Um, it's not actually blue or red, but that, uh, that's where it is. And um, that is the, the system that, that is also where you represent, and uh, <coughs> Joe Chow has done some wonderful experiments where you represent the prestige of Toyota, different models of Toyotas, or the rank of, of military officers. Uh, if you know anything about the rank of military officers, if you use people who did, um, that's where that's the area that is, is doing the processing basically for that. Okay, and it's probably well, it's definitely in part at least, and to a large degree, mediated by testosterone. So um, if if two individuals or two teams or you know 
two chimpanzees. Uh, if there's a co dominance contest, the winner, uh, the winner's testosterone blood levels increase, the loser's testosterone blood levels go down. And if you administer testosterone, you get a more aggressive animal that fights for dominance. Um, and if your team, if your soccer team loses, your testosterone level generally declines, okay, compared to what it would be if your team had won. Um, so testosterone is involved. It clearly emerged from some kind of generalization and, ge and, and, and <coughs> an ability to be generative around linear orderings based on uh, the nearly ubiquitous dominance hierarchies that are present in nearly all social animals. Not quite all, but in nearly all, there are, there are linear dominance hierarchies. They're nearly linear, but usually almost, almost entirely linear. Uh, and uh, human authority ranking was probably uh, both an evolutionary and cultural uh, emergence out of those uh, dominance hierarchies. So communal sharing, authority ranking, what's the third relational model? Well, people vote. They play games of chance. They play games with, that have even numbers of objects and matching one to one of the, of, the, of the tokens that you have on both sides. Okay? People are even in that sense in those games and sports. Um, so the third relational model is equality matching. Okay? Equality matching is a relationship in which people attend to additive differences with a reference point of even balance. So the relationship may be balanced, but when it's not balanced, you know exactly how many units you'd have to, you know, how many turns you'd have to take, or how many dinners you'd have to invite the other person to, or how many cups of coffee you should buy for them to make things even again, okay? So it may be your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn, so it's always somebody's, always somebody else's turn because you don't remember where you started, but you know what the next step is in that, okay? In that sense, you attend to the difference. Uh, so turn taking, tit for tat, and kind reciprocity, where you, you do me a favor and I do you a favor, or uh, I drive you in the car and then you drive me in the car. Um, if you've ever heard of rotating credit associations, which are nearly ubiquitous in the world uh, before there were banks and alongside modern banks, uh, those are uh, quality matching systems, and the rules of most sports and games. Uh, uh, nearly all, but not quite all, sports and games um, in, are based on, the rules for them uh, are based on uh, you know, a one-to-one -one matching of the number of players and the turns and def defending this field, half of the field, and then taking uh, the second half defending the other half, a lottery to decide who kicks off and that sort of thing, right? Okay, um, this is, as you were thinking, those mathematicians among you, that has the structure, the, the social, uh, social system has the, the, the relations and operations that are meaningful socially, are those that are meaningful in an order to be in field, okay? In other words, addition, subtraction, the associ associative and commutative laws, right? And what kind of scale is that? An interval scale, okay? There are actually, although students didn't realize this, there are actually two kinds of interval scales, but what we're talking about mostly um, here is what's called the discrete interval scale, okay? In which there are, there are certain units or chunks that are predefined, okay? So we see equality matching in one-to-one -one reciprocity, division into equal shares. So for example, they say you get a cookie, and you get a cookie, and you get a cookie, okay, that would be equality matching. Or if we each have to bring in uh, one pie, okay, and contribute that. Um, if we divide work into even chunks, okay, whether we work alongside each other and work the same amount, or we each do six, we each produce six widgets or something, that would be equality matching. Elections, one person and one vote, um, equal rights in any common, in any sense, um, taking turns, of course, is equality matching. A lottery it involves even chances, whether it's a flip of a coin or the, the Greeks. You know, you know how Greek democracy worked, except for the generals and the and the treasurer, all offices were assigned not by vote but by lottery. Okay. So everybody was assigned for one year, only, well not everybody, you had to be 30, you had to be male, you had to be a citizen, but within those huge constraints, which meant that only the minority were equal, uh, uh, people were assigned to office by complex lotteries, multi-level lotteries, okay? Um, and as I said, the rules of most sports and games. Now, the conformation system of equality matching is concrete operations, Piaget's uh, define this as a system, and it turns out that it's a system that operates to make 
uh, equality matching relations work. So uh, it's kind of an operational definition. These concrete operations are operational definitions uh, that are procedures for balancing uh, ostensibly, in the sense that you can just see if you do it or you, or, you, or you look at it or you point to it, you see that things are equal. So if I do one, one for you and one for you and one for you and one for you and one for you, I don't have to do long division to figure out how many we each get. I just go through this procedure and if you watch that, you, have, you, know, you can agree that that was even, okay? And, or you can line up the cookies. So a cookie for each of you here, another one here, and just by looking at the length of the line and comparing them one to one and one to one correspondence, another kind of concrete operation, you can say, okay, those are even, without even knowing how many there are, without even knowing how many each person gets. Okay? So that concrete operation of taking turns, flipping a coin, uh, counting out, all right, you choose somebody, I choose somebody, you choose somebody, and the teams are made up that way, that's a fair process, the fair in the quality matching sense. Well, we don't really know very much about the neurocognitive system that supports equality matching. I don't have any idea what, what the neurochemicals are involved in that. Um, and I don't really know what, what the functional anatomy of it is. But um, if you permit me to speculate a little bit, okay, and don't quote me for this, uh, but there is a system which is called in different uh, domains of, of, of cognitive science and, and developmental uh, psychology by different names, but it's called the subitizing system or the multiple object tracking system or the parallel individuation system. But the, it's a system that animals and babies before their boat, before their uh, linguist, before their speak, and adults all have, which basically can keep track of sets of four or less. People are not always as good as four as they are with three, but usually babies and animals and so on can deal with up to four. Okay, and they can keep track, they can sort of instantly see a set of four, or a set of three, or a set of two, or a set of one, know exactly how many there are, and they can match across uh, sensory modalities. So they can match what they hear, what they see, haptics, the touch, okay? And for example, if you take a, a six month old baby, and you put four objects in a bag, baby's watching, and then you or somebody else takes out two, they're still looking, okay? You take out another one, okay, they're still looking, and then if you shake the bag and show there's none left, the baby's like, what? Because they can, they can keep up to four, they can, they can basically count without, without a number system. A number system is a cultural invention, they don't need that, they can mentally keep track of, whether, of the correspondence, whether one set is bigger than the other, as long as neither set has more than four. When it gets to five or six or seven, animals, babies, and even humans who don't have a, a, a number system, okay, there are a few cultures where they don't have a number system beyond four. They are completely lost and can't keep track unless they can do some concrete operation of lining things up or you know, one for you and one for me. Otherwise, they can't do it. But it looks like this supertizing parallel individuation multiple object tracking system, which kind of attends to one-to-one -one correspondence between sets and notices that they are one, that they're the same, one-to-one, -one, or that they're one off or two off or, or as many possibly as three off. And a baby or an animal that can do just fine, noticing that there were three objects, okay, or if, and, and two of them have disappeared, there must be one more somewhere in there, right? If you, if you do the same thing with six, they're lost. They can't do it, okay? They can't compare them. Um, and we know this functions very widely. Um, basically, it identifies one-to-one -one correspondence. And we do know where that is, okay? So we don't know for sure that this is the, the system for equality matching, but it seems to have all the right properties. And uh, it's at the temporal parietal junction. Now, we, I found somebody, it took a lot of hunting to find somebody with a brain that was pink and yellow and blue and green and brown. But when I found them, okay, uh, we also found that they had a little black circle up there, uh, <laughs> an oval, to show you where the temporal parietal junction is. It's called the temporal parietal junction, of course, because it's at the junction of the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. So, speculation. That's likely to be the system, but we haven't, nobody's done the research yet. But you have a scanner. Hey. Um, so, communal sharing, authority ranking, equality matching. What's the fourth relational model? Well, 
is one that involves the use of a lot of symbols, abstract arbitrary symbols. Uh, what is it? Well, we call it market pricing, but probably that's a bad name. Probably we should call it proportionality because it's social relations that are coordinated with reference to ratios or rates or proportions. Um, and of course, those are ubiquitous in human life, but not only in, the, in, in material objects or labor, right? But in, in interest rates and tithes and taxes and so forth, but also in concerns about efficiency, how much work is being done per, in, per unit of labor or per unit of time, and also just plain cost-benefit analysis. So if any, of you, if any of you women have a very high-maintenance boyfriend, you may be thinking, what am I putting into this? What am I getting out of it? Is it worth it, right? Or you may be making it, people make utilitarian calculations all the time. Of course, not only in a formal uh, moral utilitarian sense, although that is market pricing in the moral domain, um, but also just in thinking cost-benefit. Is this worth it to, to relate in this way to this person? Um, so that is, uh, those are market pricing relations. Now, economists, when they start thinking about proportions and ratios and rates and utilities and so forth, they, they make some additional assumptions that this model does not, they're not defining features of this model. Okay? So market pricing is not necessarily individualistic. It's not necessarily selfish. Okay? It's not necessarily competitive. Uh, it's not necessarily voluntaristic or maximizing or contractual or any of those things. It's just relations that are mediated in terms of some socially meaningful proportion. Okay? Well, mathematics, mathematicians, what is the mathematical form there? An Archimedean ordered field. Okay? An Archimedean ordered field is a mathematical system that has a defined zero point and in which every unit, every element in the system can be compared to other, to any other element uh, as a multiple of some other element. Okay? So that all elements are proportional to all other elements. And as a system of, of, of measurement and statistics, it's a ratio scale. So the operations and that are in the, in the, <coughs> the operations and the relations that are meaningful in an Archimedean ordered field or a ratio scale are socially meaningful here, which include the fact that you can, you know, you can, you can uh, treat any two elements in the system uh, as a multiple, as one as a multiple of the other or as a proportion of the other. Okay? And in human life, we see this in proportional justice. Okay? So if, if a serial murderer has been torturing children and uh, <coughs> eating them alive and uh, done, you know, and then is sentenced to a fine, okay, of uh, 100 reals, okay? Well, yes, they're guilty, but that's not a proportional sentence, right? On the other hand, if you didn't pay your parking meter and uh, the, the, you know, the police descend on you and put you in jail for 40 years, Okay? It's not that you're not guilty, you are guilty, but that's disproportional. Okay? So we care a lot about proportionality in, in, in sentencing, but also in rewards. Okay? We think that people should be rewarded in all kinds of system in proportion to their merit, um, and all kinds of cost benefit and expected utility, social decision making, criteria, you know, in, in social relations we're often talking concerned with, about efficiency in various ways, but also of course any kind of apples for oranges exchange where you say, well seven of these for two of those. Okay? And it can be material objects, it can be <coughs> immaterial services and so forth, uh, the sense of whether it's worth it. And basically, uh, you notice that the, that, the, that the root of rational is racial because rationality, the way it's usually conceived, is, is, is a system of, based on a system of, 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 you know, as in utilitarian reasoning, where everything can be, all of the elements in the system that are being computed are fungible. They all can be compared as units of some common currency, and their ratios are meaningful. The confirmation system of m market pricing is abstract, arbitrary symbols. Symbols in the narrow sense of, of Charles Saunders' purse, okay, in the narrow sense, not just the broad sense of symbols as anything that represents or means anything, but symbols in the sense that they are, that, 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 uh, the meaning of the symbol, the value of the symbol, is purely arbitrary and conventional. Okay, so your money means something only if other people agree that it means something and use it that way. If they don't, it doesn't mean anything. This is my, my uh, salary, which I was paid last night at midnight. How was I paid? In a string of zeros and ones, okay? Binary digits that are actually, I'm very pleased to have, right? But they don't actually exist in any particular place. 
there kind of been some cloud in the bank system. And it's totally arbitrary what those zeros and ones mean, but as long as everybody agrees on that, I can pay my bills, right? I can go out to dinner and so forth and so on, but only as long as those, that string of zeros and ones when I stick my card in there and put some other zeros and ones and so forth, and you know, then some more zeros and ones get moved from one place to another, but I don't actually move anywhere, you know? But the, but the numbers are changed in some way. Well, that's meaningful as long as it's meaningful, as long as people accept it that way, okay? And that's how we mediate market price and relations. And if you use a currency, it just has that same, that same arbitrary uh, meaning and use. Okay, so communal sharing, authority ranking, equality matching, and market pricing. Those are the four basic relational models. Um, and uh, let's talk about sort of some bigger picture issues around the relational model. There is a sense in which uh, social scientists at various times and places have tried to explain all of sociality using only one of these principles. Okay? So um, functionalism, which is a classic paradigm in social science, basically is always asking what holds the society together? What, what makes people identify with each other? Okay? And Durkheim, for example, was very interested in this and Weber and so forth. But it, the, the, the functional paradigm uh, is, a is, is trying to answer the question of what makes people identify with each other? What makes people feel connected? And what, what is it that perpetuates or keeps alive or sustains or constantly uh, regenerates the society? So it's, roughly speaking, functionalism is explaining or, or asking the question of, of how does communal sharing work or how, is, how are communal sharing relations created and sustained in this society? That's a little more complicated. But I think you get an insight about what functionalism is if you think about it in terms of communal sharing. Political science and, and the, the, the many theories of hegemony that, that, uh, that are popular today are primarily about authority ranking relations. Now, it's true that they often talk about power rather than legitimate authority. Um, but to the extent that they're talking about systems of status, systems of authority and rank and so forth, uh, and the stratification and status, then they're talking about something very much like authority ranking. So that is a system that, you know, that is important that you can use to explain many things. Um, uh, there is, in the 50s and, and 60s, but still today, uh, there are many people who explain social, or social interaction and social organization as, as a uh, balanced exchange. In which you give something, you get something, something back, and, things, and they, they always say, well, things come out even, although they don't actually ever hardly demonstrate that they actually do. Uh, but the assumption, the axiom is that, that uh, society consists of even exchanges. Okay? And then, of course, rational actor theory and economics is taking market pricing, adding some assumptions about, about selfishness and maximization, and creating a whole theory of society from that. Now, so it's, it's only approximately true, but it's fair to say that that what relational models theory does um, is to take uh, the, these basic relational structures that have been used in each of these theories, in each of these separate theories, and say, well, actually, they're all operating, and they're all operating in interesting combinations and in interesting recursive ways, embedded in and concatenated with each other. Um, and you won't get an adequate theory of society until you show that they're how they're all of them operating. Um, now, in another way of sort of connecting this to another broad theoretical direction uh, is to look at uh, the institutional approach to economics. Uh, Oliver Williamson and others have talked about transaction cost analyses to look at what kinds of institutions emerge to serve what sorts of functions. And they've argued that there are certain kinds of, of institutions uh, which, some of which work better under some circumstances, some of which work better under others, depending on the, what they call transaction costs. Um, and they start off as economists with the idea of markets, but they say, what are the limitations? Where do markets not work very well, and where do other institutions beyond markets emerge? Well, the first thing they look at are, are firms, okay? Uh, and uh, businesses or corporations and, and, and the non-profit uh, forms of those bureaucracies. 
And they treat those as essentially based on hierarchy. So they say, when do hierarchical relations, when are they needed in the sense that the market isn't, isn't efficient, it doesn't work well, uh, so that, that firms emerge? Because from a pure economics point of view, it's not quite clear why you would ever have a firm, why you wouldn't just have a bunch of individuals. So they address the nature of those institutions. And they don't talk about them very much, but we all know that there are partnerships, partnerships of two or 10 or 12, or, you know, in a, in, a, in a big accounting firm, there can be many partners, and of course, democracies and so forth. So this is something that's pretty much left out of the, of the institutional economics. But they do talk about what, uh, there's a guy named Ricci at uh, UCLA who, for, for some years ago, pointed out that there are more communal forms of, or, of institutions. Um, and one of those, of course, is the family, where on the whole, although other relational models are always operating in the family, the family consists of a pooling of resources, people sharing space, sharing resources, sharing the food in the refrigerator, sharing the bank account, sharing a couch in the house, and so forth and so on. Um, and so that clan form of organization is very important, especially in consumption, okay? So we can talk about, roughly speaking, about types of institutions. Now, really, all complex institutions are composed of combinations of usually all of the relational models. You can't get a very complex institution without using the uh, multiple relations models and linking them recursively together in various ways. But there's usually, there can be a dominant relational model. Um, another big picture story about the relational models is that as you go from communal sharing to authority ranking to equality matching to market pricing, there's a unique order there, okay? So in communal sharing, you make distinctions and you say there, there's, there, there could be just one kind of thing in a communal relationship, uh, just one set, but if there are more than, more than one set, more than one equivalence category, right, then there are differences. But you don't say anything about the nature of those differences. When you get to authority ranking, you say, yes, there are differences, but you add another idea of directionality of distance, okay? So you, need, you have the idea of things that are similar and things that are different, but then you have something new that isn't there in communal sharing, okay? It's the notion uh, of linear ordering, right? That, that, that there's a directionality of difference. Now, if you take the idea that there's similarity and difference or directionality of difference, and you add something more, and you say, well, how big is the difference? Then, right? Then you have an order to be in group or an interval scale. You have the quality matching, right? And then if you take the idea of that there could be difference, differences or similarities, there could be directionality to the difference, there could be distance to the difference, and then you add a new thing that there's a defined zero point in the system which allows the, the distance of ratios or proportionalities which weren't defined before. You add the notion of proportionality, then you have market pricing or an Archimedean ordered field. So there's a unique order of inclusion um, in the sense that you, you can't do authority ranking <coughs> without using the elements that are present in communal sharing, and you can't do equality matching without using the, the relations and operations that are meaningful uh, in authority ranking, and you can't do market pricing without using all of those things. So there's a unique order of those, and they form in that sense what's called the Gutman scale, so uh, in terms of the distinctions and operations. And it looks like, we don't have certain evidence about this, uh, but Vivian's going to talk about this later, it looks like when we look at the, the relational models, we're, we're just, new evidence is emerging every day about the, 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 which relational models are children can use at which, uh, at which age, and new methods are being developed that are really, really wonderful. But so it does seem fairly clear that communal sharing emerges very, very early, maybe at birth. Authority ranking probably doesn't emerge for several months. Uh, it continues to develop and become more sophisticated, but it does seem to be there. There's evidence that it's there by nine or 10 months. Equality matching, probably not till kids are three or four. Market pricing, probably later, okay? So there's an ontogenetic order that may be related <coughs> to this government scaling. And if you look at the mega history, the, the super long durée, right? The earliest societies, as far as we can tell archeologically, were primarily, and we don't know for sure, of course, but it's really hard to get the evidence, but they looked as if they were primarily communal sharing. They used the other relational models probably, but they were dominated, the, the sort of root and core foundational relational models communal sharing. 
Authority ranking seems to emerge in the archaeological record when you either have storable goods that you're collecting and that are transportable and therefore uh, exchangeable with others, or you do farming, which produces also storable goods. Okay? And when you have farming, or even certain kind of ex excess production um, in, in among hunter gatherers, then you get chiefs. You get institutionalized authority ranking. And only much later does equality matching emerge fitfully, uh, and you get kind of democratic systems and egalitarian systems. And market pricing, although it may have been there in the background and in, 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 in a small part of many societies or all societies for many millennia, as a dominant form of social organization, uh, it's, it's a pretty recent uh, thing in the last few hundred years. And we know that in the last 50 years, even in the last 10 years, there's more and more and more things are organized through market pricing that never were before. So there does seem to be a, a, a supra-historical sequence. It's not simple because any particular society can, you know, chiefs can arise and then the society can both collapse and do hunting and gathering. And, but the long-term trend, okay, looks like it is, is, corresponds to this order. Now, a couple of other things need to be said. Um, one is that uh, uh, just because people are in each other's presence doesn't mean that they're using any relational model to coordinate. Okay? So if people treat each other as pure objects, pure material objects, and they don't have any sense of trying to coordinate with reference to a morally meaningful uh, relational model, then, then we would talk about them as using the null model or basically not using any model. Okay? So if the bullets are flying and I get out of the way behind a tree, okay? There's no relation to the model, right? Uh, there's a fallen tree, and I get behind that. Oops, it's not actually a fallen tree, it's a corpse. As long as I treat that corpse as just a barrier of bullets, right? There's no relation to the model. Now I find the person is alive, okay? And I think, oh my God, I'm drawing fire toward this living person, okay? And I, if I feel compassion or shame, or feel that this is unequal or whatever, now I'm, now I'm related. Okay? If I'm running down the sidewalk and I don't and I avoid running into lampposts and, and telephone poles and, and fire hydrants, there's no relational model. If I avoid running into people as if they were mere physical objects, there's no relational model. But if I feel like I should go to the right, and I'll be embarrassed and people will be angry if I move to the left, now we're coordinated. Okay? Now there's a relational model. So the mere co-presence of different persons doesn't mean that they are coordinated, right? Um, so this, this is what's necessary for there to be a relational model. These are what makes a relational model a relational model. Okay? Now, I've talked about the relational models without talking about culture yet, but you can't understand really what the relational models are without considering what culture is. Because the relational models are never real. They never come into being as real things um, without being implemented in a specific cultural way. So if I say communal sharing, okay, let's have equivalence groups. You say, cool, let's do that. But you still have to define who is in what group, right? The baby being born doesn't know what the, it does know that there are going to be likely some equivalence groups, but it doesn't know who will belong to which one. The baby being born says, oh, I wonder if there are hierarchies here, but doesn't know where they will operate with respect to what kinds of decision-making or work or production or consumption, and certainly doesn't know who is in what position in the hierarchy. Those things have to be specified by the culture. Okay, so so, does, so do the units in equality matching. So when my wife and I decided to have, have babies, we agreed that we would do equality matching, okay? be even about the childbearing responsibilities. And when, after the first four months I had to lift the finger, okay, when the first baby was born, she said, where's the equality matching? I said, what are you worried about? You raise the first one, I'll raise the second one, you can raise the third one, and that'd probably be enough, three is probably good enough. Okay? Well, obviously that's a joke, but the point is what counts as the unit in equality matching? What counts as a turn? The kids on the playground fight about what counts as a turn. And there are conventions and prototypes and precedents and so forth that tell you what counts as a turn, okay? What counts as a tit or a tat, okay? And those all have to be specified 
or you can't implement the relational models. So they're empty of content. They're indeterminate. That makes them able to be used in innumerable different ways. Each relational model can be used in innumerable ways and generatively used to construct new forms of coordination. But it means that you can't do anything with them to coordinate without cultural uh, complements. They're called <coughs> creos because they're precedents and prototypes and precepts and proverbs and uh, proscriptions and prescriptions and paradigms and so forth and so on. These prios complete the relational mod, or, the, or what's called the mod. The mod being the part that's innate, which is the structure, but an empty structure that doesn't tell you how to do it in any particular case. Okay? So you need to know, the culture has to tell you, okay, the prios, the precedents and prototypes and precepts and prescriptions and so forth, have to tell you when to use each relational model, with whom, with regard to what, and how. Okay? Otherwise, you can't use them. So you can't use this innate equipment without <coughs> the cultural complement that make it work. And a simple analogy is that is we all have a, a competence and actually a very strong motivation to speak a language. But you can't speak universal grammar. You can only speak a particular language. So that whatever innate capacities we have for language, and there's a lot of argument about what they consist of and so forth and so on, but we, we, we all agree that whatever that is, it isn't sufficient to enable you to communicate. You have to, you have to, uh, you have to, you know, set the parameters. Is the way it's usually talked about in linguistics, uh, in order to determine which language you're speaking, and you have to speak a particular language. So the same thing is true of communal sharing, authority ranking, and so forth. You can't do them generically. You have to do them specifically, and there are innumerable ways within each culture to do them. So there are different kinds of turn taking in different situations. There's different kinds of equality in different kinds of situations, and so forth and so on. So within and across cultures, there are huge differences, and there are differences in the context in which they apply them. So marriage can be organized as this communal thing, where we just all love and share, or as an equality matching relationship, where we keep even, or as in many traditional societies, as an authority ranking thing, where somebody's in charge and leads and guides and protects and looks out for and speaks up for and, and speaks for the subordinate, or the kind of market pricing thing, where you say, okay, you know, well, what am I getting out of this? What am I putting into it? Uh, you know, is it a good bargain that I'm getting here? Okay? So different cultures use different relational models in different ways, but without the culture to tell you how to use it, you can't use any of the relational models. And they're no good to you because they're insufficient. So let's suppose that you're going <coughs> to rank people in a given domain by authority ranking. Are you going to relate rank them by their, uh, you know, by whether they're, you know, <coughs> provost, dean, uh, you know, full professor, associate professor, and so forth, or you can be ranked them by the number of scalps they've taken, or in the West African society where I work, it's, it's almost entirely by age. And if you're older, you're older, and then you're superior, okay? Um, or by gender, as, they all, as many cultures do, okay? So you can, you can rank people by all kinds of descriptive and achievement systems, but you have to have some system for putting people in a rank order, or you can't have authority ranking. And the same thing, you know, you can you can say, okay, we're going to do, uh, uh, you know, we can use any any relational model to organize who gets to play on the swing. The older kids get to go first, or the younger kids get to go first in an authority ranking system. But then you still have to say, well, what counts as a turn, and you know, how long, you know, does that, you know. So all of these things have to be both culturally specified and often negotiated as to what counts as what. Okay. Yeah. So we have we have uh, so we have voting systems that are based on equality matching. But as you know, there's been, there's been debates and historical changes in what counts as a person who gets to have a vote. Okay, is it a landowner? Is it male? Is it a citizen? What about felons? If you're convicted of a felony, do you lose the right to vote? How old do you have to be to vote? And so forth and so on. You can have equality matching, but you can't have equality matching without having it in specific ways and specifying who counts as an equal person. Uh, so uh, a huge debate today is, are, is a fetus a person? Does a fetus have equal rights with a, a, bo a person who's already born? And obviously a lot hinges on whether they do or they don't. So any kind of social coordination requires a knowledge of the relational models and knowledge of when to use them and how to use them, with whom, with regard to what, and so forth. Okay? So this is a theory not only of what's innate, but what's cultural. 
and how the two things are necessary for each other and complement each other and fit together to enable social coordination. And it, therefore, it also provides a language for comparing cultures, for comparing historical changes, for understanding ideological debates, and for going into another culture and figuring out what's going on there, uh, either as an anthropologist or sociologist or as an immigrant or somebody marrying in or whatever. And it's a way of understanding why we, you know, why we find other cultures upsetting and confusing and, and bad in various ways. Because we, when we see people using the wrong relational model, we say, oh, no, you're not supposed to do it that way. <laughs> and we, we, don't, we, we, we just see it wrong, and we don't see that it's implemented. And the same thing can be true in a couple. Okay, so if you are using your relational model, so, you know, your partner and you are, are washing dishes. You, know, you, you have to wash dishes in your house, okay? And you washed dishes, the dishes yesterday, okay? And now you're, you have your feet up and you're reading a newspaper and watching TV and you're wondering why, the guy is wondering, why isn't she washing the dishes? Well, she has a migraine, she has a report due tomorrow, and she was up all night with the baby, okay? And she's thinking, what a jerk this guy is. Why isn't he washing the dishes? And he's thinking, oh, it's a quality matching. I washed the dishes last night. Obviously, you've got to wash the dishes tonight. But you're thinking, come, you know, Sharon, you know, he's, he's got nothing to do. i got everything going on in my life. You know, if he loves me, if this is a communal thing, he ought to be washing the dishes. And she, he's thinking, her turn. Why doesn't she wash the dishes? Okay? So if you use different relational models, or if you use the relational models and implement them differently, so you, you agree that there should be a quality matching for childbearing, but, but you don't think it should be one first you and then me and then you for the whole all the childbearing for that you know for that part, for that offspring. But you think it should be even every day, okay? Then everybody's unhappy and, and, and sees the other person is doing it wrong, okay? So within you know within a relationship between cultures, there's a lot of misunderstanding, but conversely, there's a lot of possibility for understanding if you if you can analyze it in these terms. Um, now, so the indeterminacy of the relational models and their completion by the cultural complements uh, is what enables humans to generate the, 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 the complex forms of coordination that the, the Inuit use in the Arctic and the foragers use in deserts and, and <coughs> farmers use in the, you know, uh, in the Alto Plano and so forth and so on. Uh, you, can, you can generate innumerable forms of of coordination and generate new ones as new technologies enable new ones to exist. Conversely, it turns out that new technologies are often developed in order to enable new ways of coordinating new forms of relationships. Uh, uh, but well, we can talk about that some other time. Okay? Um, yeah. So, this is a way that a very small number of relational models enable you to coordinate uh, an indefinitely large number of forms of uh, <coughs> social coordination uh, and by combining them. And I haven't talked quite so much about that, but uh, combinations are important. So for example, uh, if we have an election, we're using equality matching to put people in a position of authority ranking, right? But conversely, the teacher can say, using her position of authority ranking, vote on this. Which vote on which project we're going to do, and she can authority ranking can you know can lead to communal sharing, and uh, I mean to to equality matching, and so forth. So it's very often true that one relational model <coughs> is the framework for in which another relational model operates. Um, Yeah, and so this is kind of an alternative to the modularity idea <coughs> that many evolutionary psychologists talk about, in which they assume that there's a, 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 a module, a distinct neurocognitive system uh, for solving every adaptive problem, in this case, every form of cooperation. Well, if that were true, we'd first of all have to have an infinitely large number of, or a huge number of modules, because we coordinate in so many different ways. And then every time the technology changed or the environment changed, we wouldn't be able to, to find new ways of coordinating without spending, you know, without thousands of years passing to develop new modules. But if we have modules that are generative, <coughs> CS, AREM, and MP, if we have these generative modules, then we can constantly develop new ways of coordinating that, as, a, as a function of the technology and the environment and the social situation and so forth. <coughs> So the argument is that if you, if you look at any domain of sociality, 
whether it's, you can have a decision making. Well, how could you do that? Well, you could have, you could make a decision by consensus. That's communal sharing. You could make a decision by the, the, the superior deciding and delegating. You could make a decision by voting or lottery. That would be equality matching. You could make a decision based on cost, you know, cost benefit analysis or bidding and auctions and so forth. That would be market pricing. The same thing for transactions. All kinds of transactions exist. CSAR, EM, and MP. Uh, and, and in each kind of uh, transaction. So for distribution, for contributions, for exchange, and so forth, each of the relational models can organize things. Work can be organized in any of these ways. Moral judgments and emotions. Tej Rai and I wrote a paper and uh, published in Psych Review three, four years ago now, I guess, uh, arguing, you know, showing that these relational models are the basis for moral judgment, that, that moral, moral emotions and motives and moral cognition in general consists of the regulation of relationships, uh, i.e., the regulation of relational models. So uh, the sanctions, forms of sanction and redress, whether you uh, have to make restitution and pay, you know, pay a fine or, or, or is, you know, is, is a market pricing kind of way of, <coughs> of redressing a, a wrong, uh, uh, you know, replacing what you damaged or what you destroyed is, a, is an equality matching way. Uh, physical chastisement is often, you know, a, an authority ranking way. Exiling somebody or ostracizing them is a communal sharing response and so forth. Political ideologies you can analyze in this way, the meanings of time, the meanings of objects, the meaning of places. So um, land, for example, can be a commons that we share. It can be, it can define uh, the, the, uh, in the feudal system, the, the, you know, you, there, there's a ranking system that, that defines who can use what land. Uh, in a homesteading system, each person gets an equal, or each family gets an equal allotment of land. And of course, land can be uh, rented and bought and, and, uh, and so forth um, in a market pricing way. Social influence, we could talk about that. There are different kinds of groups formed in, in with social identities. There are forms of sexual relations in marriage uh, for each of these relational models, and also forms of aggression and violence. So uh, I wrote a book with Tej Rai that just came out a few months ago uh, called Virtuous Violence, which shows how relational models um, organize um, nearly all violence in, across cultures and, and across history. Um, and basically, uh, any kind of social uh, issue that you wanted to look at. Um, I want to very briefly addre address the issue uh, of, of one, la one last issue, and that is why are there just four relational models? Why aren't there seven or 77 or an infinite number of relational models? Okay, because you'd say, okay, I accept the idea that maybe four relational models can be implemented in innumerable different ways, combined and nested and you know recursively connected to each other, so as to create enormous complexity and diversity. But why are there just four? What is it about four? And why these particular four and not a bunch of others? Well, there are two or three different kinds of answers to that, each of which is in some ways pretty persuasive, um, but they're quite different kinds, OK? Um, and they address the question of sort of, are these the best ways in some sense? And if so, why are they the best? Um, why would these have come out? Uh, why would these ha have emerged? Um, well, one question is, what makes a good coordination structure? What makes coordination possible? Well, the easiest to use and most flexible r ones uh, have to, you know, the, the, the best, the most flexible relational models uh, would have two properties, stability or consistency. So relations and operations would remain unchanged under certain common transformations. So you can think of it, one transformation is inflation, where the prices of everything change. Now, if everything changes in perfect or, or changing the, the currency as you go from, you know, from, from one country to another. Um, Another thing uh, is simplicity. So there ought to be st stability and consistency to make a good system of coordination. There also ought to be simplicity in that all elements should have the same properties. It's going to be really confusing if some elements have some properties, but, but other elements have different properties that make them difficult to combine and so forth. 
So um, uniqueness is the stability under transformations. So we know that a ratio scale is unique up to a multiplication by a positive constant, okay? In other words, the relations don't change if you multiply all the values by 6, okay, or 8.2. If you multiply by a negative constant, everything is messed up. If you add a constant to each value, the, the ratios are not the same, right? But a ratio scale is unique up to multiplication by a positive constant. An interval scale is unique up, up to a linear transformation. Okay, an ordinal scale is unique up to any monotonic transformation, and a categor categorical scale is unique up to any one-to-one -one categorical mapping at all. Okay, and this is what defines actually the scale types. But what it means is that we're talking here about structures which are unusual in mathematical structures in the sense that um, they, the relations of each in each kind, the relations that each relational model defines, remain the same under certain transformations. And arguably, that's a valuable property. And it turns out that if you add one more thing, which is homogeneity, if you add one more feature that you're looking for, which is that all the elements uh, in, this, in the sense, all the elements in the set should have the same properties, okay? Well, it turns out um, Krantz and Supis and Luce and, and other uh, uh, the people who, who have studied measurement scales have shown that there aren't seven or 77 <laughs> mathematical structures that have the requisite degrees of homogeneity and uniqueness, that is, that are stable, where the, where the relations remain the same under certain kinds of the transformations, different, in each case, a different transformation, and where all the elements have the same properties. And that, although they don't call, because they're interested in systems and the real numbers, they don't actually uh, look at um, uh, the categorical scale as a scale at all. Um, but they've shown that the only structures that have the, the, the requisite degrees of homogeneity and uniqueness are the ratio scale, a, two kinds of discrete, uh, in, a discrete interval scale and a, and a non-discrete interval scale, okay, and a linear and an ordinal scale. Those are the only structures, okay, um, that have the right kinds of homogeneity and uniqueness that, that make sense for measurement. And, and it may be that the properties that make a mathematical system good for measurement make it also good for social relations because it has the flexibility and the simplicity that you want, okay? And a whole different approach was, uh, was um, uh, developed by um, two applied mathematicians. Um, uh, Didier Sornet started out as a, as a geophysicist <laughs> and then became uh, an expert in finance using mathematical modeling uh, in both cases. And his, uh, his uh, student, who, who now has her PhD, uh, Mauricia Favre, they analyzed the fundamental possibilities for dyadic exchange contingencies. In what ways can, the, can what I do for you be contingent on what you do for me. And uh, although the details are, are, you know, take some careful thinking, uh, the logic isn't that complicated. And what they proved are that these four relational models are the only possibilities under some quite reasonable assumptions. Uh, these are the only possible systems of dyadic coordination. Um, and so if you want to look at that, that, that paper was published just uh, three or four months ago. Um, so there's another proof. Um, that maybe there's a, there's a, you know, maybe it's not arbitrary. Uh, maybe these are the only structures that would work well, right? Um, now, I didn't talk about the supporting evidence, uh, but there are many, many studies, uh, um, you know, of cog using, you know, all kinds of methods uh, in all kinds of contexts, uh, historical, ethnographic, ethnological, uh, conceptual analyses of various things where people have, have used these relational models as a way of understanding what's, go what's going on in the world. Um, and then all kinds of cognitive science uh, research showing how the mind works in, very, you know, in various respects um, have, been, have been used. Um, and, um, you know, experiments and diary studies, that is, studies of naturally occurring events in the real world, uh, quite a lot of uh, studies have been done. And uh, so there is, this isn't just a theory, 
Okay? Now, you, we could look at any one of those hundreds of studies that have been done and, and, and look at the methods, critique them, and so forth and so on. But, but what makes me excited about this is that all kinds of methods have been used from observational and participant kinds of methods, qualitative methods, to very quantitative ones, to experiments in a lab, to uh, collecting data about naturally occurring events, and so forth. And what we find uh, over and over again is that there's all kinds of support for this theory. Um, so, um, you know, there's plenty more that could be said about this. Um, but if um, if you want to look up, um, you know, the literature on this, you can go to rmt.ucla.edu, um, and I'll make a PDF of this uh, uh, this talk available um, on the website of the workshop or, or or whatever. But I would like to learn from you, as philosophers and others, um, what you know, what makes sense here, what doesn't make sense, what new applications that I haven't mentioned. Uh, you know, how do you see this connecting with other ideas that I don't know about or uh, that I don't see the connections with? Um, what empirical phenomena do you feel are illuminated by this? Why do you feel that this couldn't quite be right because of something that you know about the world or whatever? So any kind of questions to, to clarify what I've said or to argue with me um, or, uh, you know, Make distinctions that I haven't made, whatever you'd like to do. We have a few minutes to do that. So. Yeah, and, and use the microphone if, if you have something to say. So if you push the little button in front, the red light will light, and that will indicate that we can hear you and you're being recorded. I have a question about uh, social cognition. Uh, yeah. Relational models theory is about uh, once you account the entire social cognition or it's more like a subset? Because uh, when we see in social cognition like theory of mind, we talk about uh, individuals, yeah. uh, mental states of one individual, her his personality traits, and other things. and. Uh, this, the relational models, seems to be another kind of level about, not about individual, but relations about individuals. Yes, exactly. Well, and Vivian's talk after coffee is going to be exactly about theory of mind and relational models and how they're connected and what priorities they have and which are necessary for what kinds of things. So that's exactly what she's going to talk about. And she knows more about it and understands it much better than I do. So can defer that part, but um, with great uh, pleasure and confidence. But my sister is probably the most famous person in social cognition, Susan Fisk, a very distinguished social psychologist. But I can tell you that the kind of thing that she does, and most people uh, in social cognition do, and how it differs from what I'm doing here, is that most of the research since the cognitive revolution in social psychology, not all of it, but most of it has been about person perception. It's about how do I perceive individuals, categorize them, and make inferences about invisible properties like, you know, their desires, their thoughts, and, and so forth. So relational model theory is not about that. It's not about how I make inferences about chairs and what's inside them and what will happen when I sit on them. Uh, that's a form of cognition, right? And if you, if instead of thinking about chair cognition, you think about cognition about human homo sapiens, but, but if you treat it as, as trying to understand what kinds of, you know, if you look at chairs, we might have cognitive, cognitive systems for grouping them in different kinds of chairs and making inferences about, you know, the properties that you can't see in the chair or that you can only see indirectly and so forth. That would be social cognition when, when, when it's applied to persons. So it's really cognition about persons. But what I'm interested in is not the way people perceive individuals. I mean, that's interesting too. But what I'm doing in relational models theory, and other people have done in developing the ideas, is understanding what are the properties of the relationship, which are not merely properties of the two persons. You know, we can't add, you know, your your gender, age, intelligence, attitudes, and so forth to Vivian's gender, age, intelligence, attitudes. 
that doesn't tell us anything about the relationship, right? So the properties of the two of you aren't properties of the relationship, right? And um, so it is true, of course, that we do need to understand the way people think about other persons, especially in, and social cognition is mostly, although not entirely, sort of takes as its paradigm how I understand individual strangers, right? Where I'm talking about what, what, once people start to interact, and my sister and I wrote a paper together where we argued that an awful lot of person perception is perceiving the, the features of the person that are relevant to how I might interact with them. So there is a connection between how, you know, when I look at a person, I think, okay, this would, well, you know, and then and I, I hear about this person from other people, and I, 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 I make inferences based on the appearance of the face and the facial expressions and so forth and so on, <laughs> gender, age, and so forth, and I think, okay, maybe if we start interacting, we might be interacting like this, and these would be issues, and those wouldn't be. So a lot of person perception is, is I think, although it hasn't, it's not the way it's been looked at, mostly by person perception people, is inferences about how, how you might relate to them. But those are different levels of analysis, as you say. Yeah, it's on. Have you heard about any linguistic research using relational models or using linguistic evidence to find relations between these models? So if I, is, is there research using that's linguistically oriented about relational models here? Yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean by linguistically oriented. Um, we have used evidence from language in various ways. So, for example, I talked about the confirmation systems, right? It turns out that if you look at the history, you know, if you look at, <coughs> at, at, at historical linguistics, uh, the earliest Chinese writing that's been preserved, probably was people writing on soft things, but when they started writing on the front shells of the turtles, the turtle plasters and on the scapula and the shoulder blades of sheep, they were writing about uh, divination, which is another interesting but if you look at the pictograms, how did they think about, how did they represent relations of status and, and authority and so forth? They represented them as big and above, okay? So there, we're using language indirectly, and it turns out that the Sumerian words for authority, and again, the other really ancient, ancient language, they also refer to people in authority as the people who are above and in front and bigger and stronger. That's the way they talked about it. And they talked about conquering and, and, and subordinating another city-state in terms of the brightness, the brilliant, the literally brilliant, the likeness of the, of the leaders and so forth. Another <coughs> uh, aspect of contemporary language is that if, if you ever call somebody you know by the wrong name, even though you know perfectly well what their name is, or your parents call you by your, you know, by your sister's name or something like that. Um, well, I did that when I had kids and, and I was wondering why I was doing it. And we turned that into a bunch of studies uh, one of which uh, my, my sister also was involved in action. Um, and it turns out that when you call somebody by the wrong name, when you know perfectly well who they are, what predicts whose name you'll substitute? It turns out that the best predictor is what kind of relationship. So you, it, it, it's as if when you're, if I had a communal relationship with you and I, and I knew who, your name and I called you by the wrong name, I will most of the time pick somebody else with whom I have a communal relationship. Okay? It's as if I remember what kind of relationship we have, but I can't remember who, you know, which communal relationship this is, or who, we, you know. So I, I think, I keep thinking, so I, if I have an uh, equality matching relationship with you, and I call you by the wrong name, most of the time I pick somebody else with whom I have an equality matching relationship. So that's evidence that acts, that implicit in the way people are, are interacting and representing other people is that they're representing other people as participants in certain kinds of relationships. And the errors are pretty consistent. They're not many factors affect who you substitute. But it turns out that, that, that they are very consistent. That a huge factor is that you, that you the substitutions tend to be within relational model. They also turn turn out to be within gender, which is interesting. And, uh, and, and other factors predicted too. And the same thing is true if you ask people to just remember everybody you've ever, ever interacted with, okay? Which is hard. But like, you know, it's you're generating a list for uh, wedding invitations or Christmas cards or something like that. Just everybody you can think of. Or maybe you're thinking of, you know, who did I tell that to? So who would I ever... 
Well, all kinds of things affect the order in which you do this memory dump. But one of the things that affects this is that you tend to cluster people with whom you have the same kind of relationship, even though that's not an explicit retrieval tool. So the explicit tools are, let's see, was it one of my girlfriends? Was it one of the people in my neighborhood? Those are the explicit terms. But, input, but also, con uh, there's, there's clustering, or runs, as it's called, uh, of people with whom you have a communal relationship, and then a bunch of people with whom you have an authority ranking relationship. So that's evidence. Um, also, other kinds of social substitution. So if you misremember who you did something with, you're likely to misremember the kind of relationship but, but pick the wrong person within that kind of relationship. Or if you, uh, you know, we, we ask people to collect cases where they dialed the wrong number or drove to the wrong house. Or we even had people told us about the stories about giving the presents to the wrong person or sitting in a movie theater and holding hands and say, whoops, who am I holding hands? And, uh, so misdirected actions turn out to be directed within the, relational, the same relational model. The errors are not random. Uh, you tend to remember what kind of relationship you, you have better than who it is that, it's, that that person is. Okay. Um, so there's that kind of evidence that, well, of course, hand-holding and calling somebody by the wrong number is not linguistic evidence, but, but misusing a name is. Um, now, what, a lot of things haven't been done that would be very interesting. Um, so to analyze you know, the use of pronouns, and uh, it's clear that, that politeness and respect, uh, uh, what we call them linguistics, but uh, status you know, language, um, you, know, you could look at, uh, basically you could look at whether there are different linguistic forms that are used in this. And of course, Brown and Levinson famously pointed out that, that there's this interesting thing in which you use the same markers for addressing somebody subordinate and somebody intimate. And what does that tell us? And what, how would you relate that to relational models? And so th there's a huge uh, opportunity for people to, to do linguistic analysis of this. And, and to relate the linguistics to the other forms of communication. So what's the relationship between hugging somebody and the words you use? What's the relationship between sharing your food and, you know, what do you, you say, oh, this is good, have some, you know, and, and what, what are the linguistic forms that are around these non-linguistic forms of communication. Um, and we know that some, that there is a good deal of encoding in this because you use words uh, in authority rankings, for example, that, you know, indicate that somebody's big, that they're majestic, <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, use words that indicate that they are higher or lower and so forth, um, but much, much more could be done. And in communal relations, you may say, my baby, my sweetie. Well, what is a sweetie? It's a, that's something you eat, right? So it's sort of a reference of, you know, some substance there. Yeah. But uh, lots more could be done. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so, I wonder about uh, the the number or the, the quantity of models. Mm -hmm. uh, so you sustain that th th there are many reasons, and some are mathematical reasons for sustaining this number four of models. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time. I wonder if genetic facts and, I don't know, uh, behavioral facts could change that in what, uh, if, um, for example, if, if we see uh, anthropological theory as a, constru a constru uh, construct and at the same time models are mean to interpreted our culture and our evolution, biological evolution. So um, why to s maintain that we should restrain our interpretation to four models? Even if mathematical, uh, from a mathematical point of view, there are evidence to, s to maintain that, to sustain four models. Shouldn't we search for more? Well, we should sure search for more, absolutely. 
<clears throat> and I tell you, since I started talking about this 24 years ago, <clears throat> every time I, especially the first few years, every time I stood up, I thought, I was just, you know, people, one is off, often scared before one gives a talk, but I thought, this is gonna, this is really, you know, what is it gonna be when somebody in the, says, well, that's very nice, Dr. Fisk, thank you for this, but what about this model? And what about this one? And somebody else said, what about this one? And then I would say, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. You know. <clears throat> but one thing I can say is that in the literature and in the presentations, <clears throat> so far nobody's come up with model number five or six or seven, so that's one thing. But the other thing is that you have to understand that <clears throat> I developed this very inductively by reading about the way people organize labor, the way people organize exchange, the way people make decisions, <clears throat> the way they use material objects and give them social meaning and, and the meaning of land, the way people organize you know, aggression and, and, and violence. And it isn't that I, well, so, so in, in many ways this is an inductive theory. And what I say is every time I look at a new domain, it looks like really there just seem to be these four ways of organizing things. So for example, when I <coughs> had developed this theory of fair ways, but I was still looking at it, I said, well, I better look at work and how it's organized. And I find this guy, Stanley Udi, who had looked at, actually two times in his career, he had done large study, studies where he looked at, 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 at hundreds of different cultures, how they organize work. So if one person isn't sufficient to do the work, how do you get other people? And he called these things by different names, but he found four ways of work, you know, <laughs> of organizing, recruiting and organizing labor. And I, when I saw that, I said, oh my gosh, you know, there's gotta be something fundamental here because you know, these are not just four moral systems and four ways of um, exchanging, but they're, you know, if you have to organize the work of more than one person, how do you get, you know, how do you do it? And he had done two large scale, you know, things where he looked at, in each case, at hundreds of cultures to see how they organize things. And they, each culture might use more than one, but he, you know, he had independently come up with these four. So, uh, yes, there's an empirical question. Are there things, and I think that these are the four forms of, the four relational models that are, that can be used across all domains of social life, from decision making to work, to land and material objects and exchange and so forth, that exist, seem to exist in all cultures where we've looked at them, and you know, across historical periods, but there are a few other coordination mechanisms that probably don't reduce to these relational models. So one is, the one I actually snuck in here, staying to the right, or staying to the left, if they were you know, on a path, probably doesn't, doesn't seem to be any of these things, but it is a coordination mechanism. Now notice though, it's only used in one context. It's only used about motion when there's there's a path or a route, and it isn't used for organizing anything else, right? In chess, there's something called castling. So if you haven't been in check, okay, you can take your castle and your king, if there are no pieces intervening, and you can move them like that. That's a rule in chess. But it isn't a rule, you can't castle, except if you're playing chess, <laughs> right? So there's a coordination rule or system, but it's restricted to a specific domain. So there are, I think, some coordination systems or models mm -hmm. that are very specific to particular domains, like when you're walking or riding your horse or driving your car, you know, stay to the right, or depending on what country, you know, stay to the left. That isn't really probably any relational model, but it's only used in that one domain. But when you look for coordinating systems that are generative, that are usable across domains, and that people constantly come up with to organize new things, these seem to be it. Now, that's an empirical question. You could say, well, you could send me an email <laughs> a year from now or tomorrow or something and say, what about this? Because here's this relational model. That, you know, and maybe there are others. I don't know of them yet. Mm -hmm. Now, another question that's implicit in what you're saying, and Vivian's also going to talk about in a few minutes, is what, how have we evolved the capacities for the are there other animals that, that organize, uh, many other animals are social, they're not as complexly social or generatively social or as variably social, but they are social. What, 
do all animals have all these relational ca ca capacities or not? Mm -hmm. And um, Vivian's going to tell us the answer to that. But, um, so, you know, that's a, this is a phylogenetic and evolutionary question. Mm -hmm. And there's also an individual difference thing. So it turns out that some people overuse certain relational models or underuse certain relational models. So suppose that in every situation that you're in, you feel very communal toward everybody and you want to be best friends with everybody and you assume that they want to be best friends with you and they want to share everything with you and they want to hear everything about your life and you, you know, pretty other people are going to get very uncomfortable with you, okay? Or suppose that you think that, you think authority ranking is the only way that things work here and, of course, suppose you want to, everybody to lead you and direct you and guide you and protect you, well, people are going to say, no, no, I don't have time for that, you know? Or you think that you're the most important person in the room, always, okay? So if you overuse a model and don't use it the way the culture specifies, then you get something that looks very much like a personality disorder. So Nick Haslam uh, <coughs> and his colleagues uh, have done some interesting studies that show that although personality disorders are very difficult to measure and assess and discriminate, uh, over and under use of, of, of specific relational models seems to map pretty well onto personality disorders. Also, you can imagine that if you expect if you if you expect people to be perfect partners in each of these relationships and don't give them any slack, you might be constantly disappointed, <laughs> and then you might get depressed, or you might have borderline personality disorder or something. So you can imagine that misuse or socially aberrant culturally aberrant use of the relational models might be highly, you know, might be behind a number of psychological disorders. And there are individual differences. I, I don't really like authority ranking very much. Oh, well, I got a big professor, you know, and then nobody tells me what to do. You know? But I wouldn't fit very well in the military or in most bureaucracies, but I found a niche for myself, right? You know, I've gotten in trouble a number of times in my life because I it didn't occur to me to be subordinate enough, right? Okay? I didn't like to think okay? But other people are happy with that, and they join the military because they love to be, to be part of the hierarchy. Okay, so there are individual differences, and they determine where, how people can fit into different situations and where they get in a lot of trouble. So, and probably those are partly experiential, but partly genetic in some way. Yeah. And, you know, we know that young men with too much testosterone are always fighting for rank, right? And that causes problems. And when they get older, or, you know, if they're women, eh, they're not quite so concerned. You know? oh. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Could you say something about, you mentioned different areas of the brain, could you say something about the work of Jacoboni and his colleagues that indicate that communal sharing and authority ranking might involve the same, utilize the same brain area? Well, I can say something about Jacoboni and his colleagues because I'm one of the colleagues on that paper, as you know. Um, <laughs> we, we did a study years ago in which we were, we thought that communal sharing and authority ranking should be those seemed very fundamental and very different, and we thought that the different parts of the brain should be activated when you observe people in doing authority ranking and communication. So we made some really nice movies, for professionally produced, professionally acted, professionally edited, and semi-professionally script written by me and the other people involved. And um, at the level of resolution of the fMRI machines at the time, we couldn't find difference between the areas of the brain activated by looking at communal sharing and looking at authority graph. Now, of course, a pixel in a fMRI machine, especially 15 years ago, from 10, 12 years ago, uh, you know, is, is a gazillion neurons, okay? So, and of course, you know, the systems may not be localized, they may be networks and so forth. So, what it does us is that there's not big anatomical differences in in, in that, and how to reconcile that with what I told you about the, uh, you know, <coughs> the insula and the and the infraparietal sulcus? I don't know. I really just don't know. Um, 
Now, what we did find in those studies that was quite interesting, and, and Marco was the, <laughs> the, the neurobiologist involved, couldn't quite believe or didn't want to make radical statements about it, but has since been amply confirmed is that the part of the brain that was activated by the system in the brain that was activated by watching social interactions is the very part of the brain that is deactivated by almost every other task that you do in a scanner. So among the thousands and thousands and thousands of things that people have been asked to do in a scanner, most of them deactivate what's called the default system. The default system is a system that's active in a scanner when you're not asked to do anything else. <clears throat> Until you're asked to do the experiment, and then that system gets turned down. Unless the experiment is looking at social interaction. And the implication of that, which I thought we should say very strongly in the paper, but Marco didn't want to climb out of, on the limb quite so far, <clears throat> so we didn't quite say it. But the implication is, and that other people have, now it's, you know, <clears throat> in all the news magazines and so forth, is that what your brain is busy doing when you're not navigating or doing your taxes or looking for something to eat is chewing your cud, mulling over your social relationships, ruminating about social relationships. And that's what, of course, the part of the brain that's also active when you're engaged in social relationships or observing. So there may, there's a distinct network, which is, it's called the default network because long before anybody showed people, not persons, okay, to come back to the first question, but social interactions, people couldn't figure out what this part of the brain was doing that it would be turned down, it would be deactivated by all these other cognitive tasks. What was going on with the brain in, by default? What is the brain busy doing that it does, you know, that that system would be, would be less active than doing all, all thousands and thousands of cognitive tasks that people do with people in the scanner? Well, it turns out that the only task that makes that system more active is looking at or thinking about social relationships. <clears throat> so there is a distinct, I mean, is that surprising? No. But the, it's interesting what particular parts of the brain are involved. And it is, uh, that system does not involve, <coughs> well, particularly the enterprise of software So that's a little bit of a So uh, the, this experiment was not repeated with the other two elementary models, just the... No, because it was record. so expensive to do. I wanted to do it with more people, with more other relational models. Marco got all into mirror neurons and, and you know, published all kinds of things. And that was a big hot field, and maybe still is. And uh, so he was coming up with exciting results on mirror neurons, so he decided to devote his resources to that. And... Uh, <coughs> So no, no, we never did equality matching and, and market pricing in the scanner and, um, and neither of anybody else we explicitly done that to, to our own. I have another one, another question. Oh, Just sorry. a comment. I heard that there was a meeting here in Brazil about it was uh, about uh, schools, education, and uh, and uh, use use of computers in schools in Brazil and so on. And also there were uh, some invitees that spoke about neuroscience and education and so on. And there were they uh, were concluding, and I'm not amazed about that that. Uh, children are, are losing uh, cognitive skills because of excessive work uh, in computers. So uh, I just related that with what you were talking mm. because. Except that right now. <laughs> well, except that. <laughs> except that. The one area of IQ that is people are people are getting better and better and better at spatial reasoning. Uh. And, and one, you know, people have seriously argued that that's because and it's boys who are getting better. It's because they play these very complex computer games that involve, uh. you know, spatial representation and being ready to shoot the guy over there and, and you know <laughs> that you have to go around here and so forth. Uh. And that actually that improves spatial skills. Yeah, that's going to lead to more authority skills. ranking. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. not the social. It's going to lead to more authority ranking. Maybe. Because <laughs> authority ranking is spatial. Yeah, <laughs> maybe so. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you.
um, you know, the, the word innate, these, the elementary models are supposed to be innate. And innate, as I understand it, just in the, I think the term might be a little bit ambiguous, but I think what it virtually always implies is just at least being unlearned. But there's more than one way to be unlearned. So in the past 50 or 60 years ago, when we talk about something psychological being innate, we usually mean biologically innate, which means it's either in the genes or maybe it's like some kind of self-organization going on in, in, the, in, in neural activity or the growth of the organism. But back in the days of, well, you know, earlier, I, I think people often had this um, Cartesian sense of what it means to be innate, that to be, for something to be unlearned or innate, so something psychological, would probably mean that's grasped by reason, that, that just reason alone grasps it. Um, and so it, it's not coded in the genome. It's not like uh, some kind of self-organizing thing. And, and, and of course, that's not what the ethologists meant by innate. Well, psychologists, though. Are, are, are people are philosophers when they talk about the mind, at least. Because yeah. I, I don't think that Descartes meant anything biological when he spoke of innate ideas. But um, um, so when you talk about reasons for believing that the four elementary models, or th for that matter, the four classic measurement scales, are the only types possible. That suggests a different kind of innateness to me, not biological, but just innate in the sense that once the brain uh, is capable of a certain level of reasoning, one just recognizes that those are the only possible forms. And my question is, when we, meet, when we talk about the elementary models being innate, what do we mean? I usually understood to be biological, and I, I, I I guess I'm sympathetic to the view that it's biological in some sense. But if, if, it's, if this really is like Favre and, so and Sonnet are saying, or, 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 or like Luce and, and, and colleagues are saying, there's just a matter of like, this is just what's possible. That seems like just general reasoning, general intelligence could just grasp these four models, like grasping arithmetic yeah. or something <laughs> like that. Well, one thing I mean by innate that I would want to, that I realize I didn't say clearly enough hardly said at all, is that I think that they are intrinsically motivating and rewarding. People need each of these things. They seek them, they're happy when they have them, and they get quite upset when they're transgressed. Okay? So that in some way people want these things and they and they get uh, they get lonely and unhappy if they don't have them and they get upset and angry if they're violent. So they're, they're they have intrinsic emotional features. Now as to the so, and I think that that's an important sense of innate, the, the motivational sense and the, and the subjective affective sense. But in addition to that, I think that um, let's suppose, and I, I think it's very probable that these structures are somehow inverted in the sense that they work in the other structures don't work Now, let's suppose that's true. Let's suppose that uh, indeed, not only do they work, but uh, certain ones are stable social structures and, 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 and exist and are transmitted. Maybe we can get this for the shortest of food spread. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. We can talk about this tomorrow. So. But uh, let me just say very briefly, if certain structures work well, yeah. and not only work well, but are also constantly used by society so that as a child growing up, they're already there. If you have the mental skills to recognize them or even to know them ahead of time, you're better off. So there should be strong natural selection or prior knowledge of these relationships if they are the ones that work well. So they could be naturally emergent. Mm. And if that's so, it was, so, natural selection would work very strongly to have you know them ahead of time, as opposed to have to figure them out, make mistakes, get them wrong, and so forth. Um, so I think that these are not alternative views. So just as just as the fact that there are material objects that are solid objects that you know and so forth and so on, that's a good thing to know already about the world. <laughs> and so you don't have to discover it because we've evolved as organisms to live in a world of material objects because it would take too long and you might get hurt and make mistakes and, and, and die while you're learning that stuff. You might as well know it ahead of time. Well thank you very much for your questions and I look forward to it. I'm going to talk to you
So let's take a break for like 25 minutes or so, and then Vivian will have a different talk. I think we should have just 15 minutes. Really? Yes, because <laughs> it's too late. Okay, 15 minutes. Yeah.